Hi everyone, thank you so kindly for joining us. Uh, I, I'm really glad to see a full house here tonight to celebrate Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City, as is appropriate for this evening. I expected nothing less, I'm really glad you all are here. Uh, my name is Carl Johnson, I'm the event coordinator for Green Apple, and it's my pleasure to welcome tonight Jane Wong and Jonathan Escoffrey to celebrate the aforementioned Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City. Let's give a hand for both of them. Uh, thank you so kindly for joining us both in person and online. We are broadcasting from San Francisco, California. We are on unceded Ramatisha Loni land, and we hope you join us in our pledge to turn land acknowledgement into action and either donate your time or monetary means to an indigenous organization each time you hear, or in my case, speak uh, land acknowledgement. Thank you so kindly. I have very brief business before we get to the fun part of the evening. First, now is a good time to silence your cell phones if you have not already. Uh, please do check out our full event calendar online at greenapplebooks.com. We have like a pretty good season ahead of us in the month of June, including the event that you are currently attending. Uh, so if you uh, are interested in other literary events, we might have something else that would pique your interest. Uh, the restroom is behind us. It is available after the event and not during the event for obvious reasons. Uh, it's also uh, only available to attendees of our event during event time. It's like the one space in the store that um, our my colleagues have that is off the floor and we want to kind of maintain that space for them. So thank you for respecting that. And thank you also for buying books from us if you have already or if you are thinking about it. Uh, if you've been here before, you've definitely heard me say that when you buy books from us, not only do you support us as an independent bookstore, you also support the authors who put so much work into making these books and then you get to have a book, which might be the best part. Um, and I think, if you ask politely, they would be willing to sign said books. Um, and we have copies of both uh, Jane and Jonathan's books at the front register. You can find them there uh, later. And there are many books in between here and there, which you might want to look at as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, actually, before I forget, very exciting. I don't have it on me. But for the Q&A portion this evening, um, we have these kind of cool um, meet me tonight in Atlantic City swag um, matchbooks. So if you ask a question, you might get a matchbook, which it, you will, but only if you ask it. <laughs> If you're like the first five people, sorry, number six, um, but we have them and I'll show you later, I promise. Um, so that's something to look forward to if you're thinking about articulating a question later in the evening. Now, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the two authors joining us. First, Jonathan Escoffrey's fiction has appeared in the Paris Review, American Short Fiction, Prairie Schooner, Passages North, Ziziva, Electric Literature, and many other places, including uh, being anthologized in the Best American Magazine Writing. He's a fellow in the University of Southern California's PhD in Creative Writing and Literature program, and in 2021, he was awarded a Wallace Stegner Fellowship from Stanford University. He was raised in Miami, Florida, and his first book, If I Survive You, was long listed for the National Book Award in 2023. Let's give a hand for Jonathan Escoffrey. And last but most certainly not least, the author of How Not to Be Afraid of Everything and Over Poor, Jane Wong is a Kundaman Fellow and the recipient of fellowships and residencies from the U.S. Fulbright Program, the Fine Arts Work Center, Breadloaf, and others. Her writing can be found in places such as the Best American Non-Required Reading, Best American Poetry, Poetry, McSweeney's, Ecotone, and many other places. An associate professor of creative writing at Western Washington University, she grew up on the New Jersey shore and currently lives in Seattle, Washington. Her memoir, Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City, is the reason we are here tonight. Please give a hand for Jane Wong. Walk up music. <laughs> 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 That's hot right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, it's so great to see so many lovely faces out here. Thank you, Car, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with Jonathan. Um, I remember when we met at Randolph College, I 
got your book and I read it immediately on the plane, like coming back um, from when I met you. And I was like, uh, can I, I can curse, yeah, holy shit. <laughs> I was like, sorry, I just like, uh, I'm just like, whatever. Um, I was like, holy shit, this is so good. Um, anyway, and it's just an honor uh, to be here with you in conversation. Uh, so I appreciate that. This is my holy shit moment was reading <laughs> Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City. And it's so uh, beautiful to see that all of you came out for Jane. Like this is a, it's such a wonderful feeling to see people show up for, for writers in general, and especially such a, a talented, amazing uh, writer and also a really uh, awesome person. Aw, thanks, Jonathan. Cheese is a cheese is an inside joke. I'm just going to leave it there. Um, okay, uh, my plan for tonight, I guess, uh, I don't know why I'm having teacher voice, like, right now. Um, it's like, in class today, we'll be doing X, Y, Z. Um, no, I'm just going to read a, a poem from uh, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything, kind of a last minute choice, just to open up the space. Um, little, little known fact is that I kind of wrote these books at the same exact time. And so in my mind, they're very entangled with each other. Um, so I think I started writing the memoir in 2017, and this started in 2016. Um, so they go hand in hand. And then I'm going to read a little bit um, from the memoir, kind of little bits and pieces, like little fragments, little snacks, if you will. Um, and I'm just going to open up with a poem um, from this book. Uh, which is called I Put On My Fur Coat. And I chose this one because this one's in my mother's voice. And uh, my memoir is all about my mom. So is this book. So is Overpour. Um, I'm pretty low key obsessed with my mom. And I make this terrible joke that I'm the kind of like knockoff cereal brand version of her. I try so badly to be her. And I'm just like, yeah, it's like, I'm not, I'm not Cheerios. I'm just like, um, whatever, circles. <laughs> Could come up with okay. I put on my fur coat and leave a bit of ankle to show. I take off my shoes and make myself comfortable. I defrost a chicken and chew on the bone. In public, I smile as wide as I can and everyone shields their eyes from my light. At night, I knock down nests off telephone poles and feel no regret. I greet spiders rising from underneath the floorboards one by one. Hello, hello. Outside, the garden roars with ice. I want to shine as bright as a miner's cap in the dirt dark to glimmer as if washed in fish scales. Instead, I become a balm and salve my daughter, my son, the cold mice in the garage. Instead, I take garbage out at midnight. I move furniture away from the wall to find what we hide. I stand in the center of every room and ask, am I the only animal here? Um, I wrote this poem because my mom, uh, when I was growing up in the memoir, talks a lot about um, class, uh, which I feel like we don't talk enough about, um, and what it was like to kind of grow up um, quite, you know, low income, working class, and we lived uh, paycheck to paycheck and like had a lot of debt. And I remember my mom, uh, I grew up in a Chinese restaurant in a strip mall in Jersey, and uh, our takeout restaurant was at the very end of the strip mall and Burlington Coat Factory was at the other end. And my mom coveted this coat, um, it cost hundreds of dollars. Um, and she bought it and she was like, basically like, forget groceries, forget the bills, forget what are these kind of daily needs, I want that coat. Um, and so she bought this coat and she wore it all the time. And uh, I put this coat on of hers when I wrote this poem. So I like literally embodied her. But I just love that kind of, I don't know, that kind of like brazen desire, I think, that she wanted to feed. But uh, she also had me when she was 20. And so I can just imagine like it's 24 year old just being like, my coat. Anyway, that's a little uh, story behind this little poem. Thanks, Jonathan, for forcing me to read a poem, too. Yeah, I have no regrets. I'm glad you did. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to read a little bit uh, from the memoir, Meet Me Tonight at Lake City. 
I don't know if we have some Bruce Springsteen fans in here. I can't get out of Jersey alive if I wasn't a Boss fan. Okay, all right, yes. So you, for those of you who know, this is a lyric from the song Atlantic City off um, Nebraska, which is uh, more of an acoustic album. Um, but uh, the memoir is a lot of things. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna get into talking a little bit about it, but um, uh, yeah, the title comes from kind of, again, growing up on the Jersey Shore, totally a Jersey girl, even though I live in Seattle, um, and I will be ending the tour in Atlantic City, which I haven't been to since I was a child, so that would be quite emotional. Um, but my father, who's not in my life, basically gambled the restaurant away, which leads to many, many things kind of like unfolding later in the memoir. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just gonna read a little bit. I think I'm gonna kick it off with the very beginning of a memoir called uh, Dragon Fruit. It's the very first section. Um, and if anyone's had some dragon fruit, you know, it has lots of seeds and it pretty much will clear your system. I kind of wanted to like start this book with poop, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Maybe that's just says a lot about me, okay. Uh, dragon Fruit. In the murky broth of yet another heartache, my mother cuts me slices of dragon fruit. I'm home in Jersey and slumped at the kitchen table. My hair is dip dyed and snot, tears and hot mascara. She hands me a slice, the white interior flecked with black seeds like suspended ants. The slice dangles on her knife, the glinting steel close to my mouth. I eat it off the knife. I've always eaten fruit this way, right off the sparks of my mother's blade. I take it into my throat, still heaving from too much survival mode, and the taste is mild despite the fluorescent hot pink flame. The seeds punctuate something I know must come. It slides down my throat like a sweet summer slug. Jane, you have to be strong. I need you to eat more, she tells me, cutting another slice. But I tell her I'm so tired of being strong. Fuck strength, fuck resilience, fuck lessons to learn, and fuck trying and trying and trying. I tell her I don't want to be strong. I can't be strong anymore, even if I wanted to be. I want to be weak. I want to fall completely apart. I want all the atoms in my body to crumble, scree of the self. I want to lie down on this cold kitchen table forever. I want to be a sloth who hasn't shit in a week, week. Cracked ice, dish soap bubbles, mild hot sauce, rabbit paralyzed by fear, my breath leaking from me like an ellipsis leak. I expect her to disagree, to demand strength, to tell me I have no choice. Did she have a choice staring at the gaping pits my father left behind? This time though, she doesn't fight me. So be weak, she says like a threat. Sticky fruit juice encircles her jade bracelet and fruit flies rattles around us dizzy stars. But you have to eat more dragon fruit and clear your system. She wants me to shit it out. And this time she hands me the knife. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> um, I, I kind of feel like I, I want to show for people in the audience is really I, oh, I love yeah. where the book starts, but it's also reading that a couple of times and then seeing the the images oh, yeah. that are in the book. Mm -hmm. It's really powerful and beautiful, and, uh, and there are more in the, in the book. Yeah, thanks for that, Jonathan. I know it's just like it's so funny because this particular photograph, it's like um, this photograph, of my smiling mother with bangs. Um, again, she had me when she was um, in her twenty, like when she was twenty. And there's me with a severe bowl cut, <laughs> staring into the void. And there's another section in the book where uh, my mom tells me the story where I was born and I didn't cry. And I just came out and stared at her. And my mom said she knows too much and handed me off to the nurse. <laughs> and my mom was uh, my conversation partner for the book launch at Elliott Bay. And my dear best friend, Michelle Penuoso, was the host. Um, and, um, you know, she asked my mom about that kind of story, and my mom said, oh, yeah, I was so freaked out by Jane. She was, she literally stared at me and didn't make a noise and was like, let's go. And I was like, okay. So it's like this, this image, you're totally right. It's just like me just staring, like, you know, a very, very awkward baby. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to read another little section. I don't know how to read. It was like prose is like 
I have a lot of feelings about prose because it's like to me it's just like a poem so you can read like 10 of them and it's fine so I guess I'm doing like little little snacks like I said um this is from a later chapter it happens right kind of smack in the middle of the book it's called the object of love and it's kind of the hardest I think the hardest chapter um that I wrote um and uh as I mentioned my father's not in my life and there's another photograph here and it's one of the photographs from Atlantic City, actually, in the hotel room, because they gave us a bunch of free hotel rooms to get my father to gamble more and more and more. Um, I talk about how in the book, um, you know, they target immigrant communities in particular, right, um, to, to kind of achieve the American dream through gambling. And because he's not in my life, uh, I couldn't get his permission for the photograph, and so they actually cut him out. So it's actually a very ghostly image to me, and I write a lot about the ghost archive in this book too, but it's, it's pretty eerie. I'm just gonna read a little bit from The Object of Love and it has little mini chapters in it. I'll just read a few. The Object of Love, the band. There's this joke I have with my close friends. There's this band called Jane and her ex-boyfriends, a rotating cast of overzealous drummers, cruel bassists, patronizing guitarists, and faux do-gooder cellists. All I do in the band is scream and play the egg shaker. <laughs> okay, you're supposed to laugh, okay. <laughs> the object of love. I think about what it means to write about heartache and the hope of love. I've written only a handful of love poems, all of which that have turned into heartbreak poems months or years later. I think about what Toni Morrison said once during an interview with The Guardian in 2012. The times I didn't write, maybe I was in love or beloved. Somebody was making me the object of love. Am I in love now? Am I writing now? I have this habit to buy new journals, clean, crisp, and empty. Without the ensuing pasta sauce stain or leaky pen marks or jagged ripped out pages, most of my journals are half finished, some even less. A bridge that simply never made it to the other side. I keep buying more notebooks, opening them up in the middle to see if they have enough weight to lie flat. I creep around bookstores, touching stationery, dreaming of the perfect ruling, the perfect semi-gloss finish. What could make me fill these pages? Why can't joy be the thing? I think about what I'm allowed to write about. I was told by several people in the book industry to focus only on the Chinese American immigrant experience on growing up poor in a strip mall takeout restaurant, immigrant gold, intergenerational trauma dessert. I remember an email I received once from a community member, a white woman who asked me to read at a local poetry event the next day. She wrote, this is verbatim, we need you, women need you, white Bellingham needs to hear your powerful poems. And then she emailed me again after I declined, asking if she could read a poem on hunger on my behalf. Can you send me a poem or two to read? They may touch on diversity. Chinese restaurant are not having enough to eat. I will read for you. And then yet another email when I didn't reply. We gathered a variety of spicy poets. They're so hungry for immigrant trauma, they laugh at blood before blood can even exist. But isn't love mine to hold to, this shimmering dip in the heart, this rattling terror? Wasn't it some kind of love that led my mother to cross that shore? Isn't love what siphons nourishment to the organs? As a Chinese American woman, as a child of immigrants, how can I divorce my experiences from love and fetish, terror and hypersexualized violence? And can't I write about all the parts, all the tentacles, all the mycelia that make me who I am? Toni Morrison continues, look, five years I've spent on some books. I suppose you can love somebody for five years, maybe. I don't mean lust, you can do that forever, but I really mean love them the way you say you love children, I don't know. That means I have to remember all the times I was in love. I keep coming back to these last sentences which haunt me. The not knowing, the wobble, the wreck, the reluctance to remember being in love, why is writing about love so hard to do? It is so hard to do. Writing is my singular love, my truest love, because I can control it. Even in doubt, I touch its familiar face. I'm going to read the very end of this chapter because it makes me laugh. It's called The Mommy Boyfriend. 
the mommy boyfriend. There's also this other running joke. My mother keeps telling me that she'll be my boyfriend. I'll be your boyfriend forever and ever and ever, she says over the phone, and she means it. I will take care of you and tell you how special you are every single day. And then she pauses and starts to laugh, but no sexy stuff. <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna pause there. Maybe I'll read another section as an answer to your question. So uh, yes, I, it's hard to explain this book. It goes all over the place, but that's like me though. So I had to be true to that, so. And I love that in the book you talk about the places that the book goes and the way you have constructed it in a kind of non-chronological order that's that's really wonderful too and thank you for the beautiful reading as well um i, I wanted to ask why that particular chapter was the most difficult for you to to write yeah that's a great question jonathan i you know i was thinking about how uh complicated i feel about being an immigrant baby, um, I feel like there's like this expectation, you know, of like writing this particular story. Um, and I, it's, I remember when I first uh, kind of started to write this book and I, let's just say I, I fired my agent or like, was okay, wait, I said, I said that. Um, or no, I was to say it wasn't the right fit. Okay, see, this is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It wasn't the right fit, um, mostly because I think he really wanted it to be a book that was located within that kind of immigrant narrative, my younger self. And he was like, what's with all these ex-boyfriends um, in the book? And what's with all the talk about love and intimate relationships? So I was like, that's inherently connected to the immigrant experience, to me. And so it's interesting that I think the object of love happens right in the middle of the book because it's almost as if the book kind of starts off with like, oh, here you are, you're gonna hear a story about like me growing up on the Jersey Shore where, you know, uh, my father gambled the restaurant away and we went to like illegal dentists and we had like in Chinatown, New York City and went through this kind of, I hope that essay is kind of weirdly funny. It's called Root Canal Street, you know? I wanted the tone in this book to have like a lot of humor despite the fact that there's so much trauma in it. Cause I, I didn't, I, did, I personally couldn't, write a sad book. Honestly, I need to laugh at so many things. But uh, I think why it's so hard to write is that it happens right in the middle of the book to kind of like awaken me and the reader. And it's just like, this is not what you're going to expect. Um, and I think that that was such a hard chapter because it really kind of dove into, I think, the things I'm the most scared of. Thinking about the title of my poetry collection, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything. Like I needed to like lay bare, I think, like all the kind of um, yeah, very sexualized violence that has been done to me um, by these said ex-boyfriends. Um, and I was like so worried that was like, oh, how is that going to be tied to me growing up, growing up in a restaurant and strip mall? But it's like, it is tied. That's my life. This is a memoir, right? Like, why would I cut out a certain part of my life? Um, and I think that that's the biggest challenge, I think, being an immigrant baby is like trying to be your most like realist self. So I think that's my answer. But yeah, it's the one I'm most scared of people reading, to be honest. Um, but hilariously, during, I never read it out loud. I had been working on that essay for many years, but when I recorded the audiobook, I had barely stumbled reading that one out loud. So it was really interesting that that one had like no, like stop. I just, it poured out of me, like kind of almost perfect, which is weird, even though I've never read it out loud. But yeah, it's a hard one. That's amazing. I have so many follow-up questions, including about the, the audio book. Um, but, but you make such a good point in terms of, as we meet these different exes, um, such a big part of it is having, there's this kind of description of taking the journey of seeing yourself through their eyes, often through an eye, the eyes of um, exotification, mm -hmm. um, which is so tied to if, if, if uh, an agent or an editor wants mm -hmm. to hear about or learn about an, the immigrant, ex the, you know, mm -hmm. an immigrant experience, how do you how do you not see how that's tied? That's that was more of a comment than a question. <laughs> I mean, that's the hardest thing is that like I 
did. One of my friends recently asked me the, such a hard question. I, I kind of was like, oh, he's like, did you achieve the American dream? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, I'm a professor. Did I? Oh, no. You know, it's like I have a lot of feelings about upward mobility. I'm the first in my family to even graduate, like, traditional high school. Um, of course, like, to even go to college. And so, like, I, I kind of am very uncomfortable, I think, with, like, oh, this idea that, like, Jane has made it or something like that. Like, I feel... I feel like I undo a lot of these layers in the book too, that like there's a chapter called Finding the Bloodline because um, I can't not write about food. I mean, I grew up in a restaurant, though I will say that it took me a long time not to actually write about food because I was so embarrassed, you know, as someone who was like, oh, if you write about food, you're so marked as Chinese. Like, you know, it's like I meet people, like white people, I should say, and they're just like, oh, I like Chinese food. It's like, hello, nice to meet you too. I'm like, okay. So I, I avoided writing about Chinese food for a long time, but I ended up, I was like, okay, I grew up in a restaurant. But in that chapter, you know, I kind of dig into this kind of like, you know, question of like what it means to, I don't know, like think about food and relationship to my exes, to my father, to my mother, like all these different parts of like me. Um, and like really thinking about you know, why I can't throw away cilantro. I have to eat like rotting cilantro and it's because of my family's history, you know, with the Great Leap Forward. So everything is entangled, I guess. The book is nonlinear um, and like very entangled because that is what migration feels like. I think maybe this is where my poetry background comes to play where I'm like really a big fan of form and content. Like, and like it has to be a slightly like, you know, messy and nonlinear in order to like replicate the feeling of like the tumult of migration. Um, but I promise you the constellation start, it does, I have, a, I have a reasoning, like the console, if you get to the end of it, the stars will align. That sounds like so woo woo, but I'll try, I try my best to make the, not the big dipper, but like the, the big hot pot. <laughs> Sorry. I, war I feel like I warned you, it's going to be bad stand up. I'm trying to remind myself I'm not I'm not watching uh, <laughs> television here. <laughs> um, that's how entertained I am. Um, and the and the the stars, the constellation. It, I mean, it, it does align. I I think it's really wonderful to hear you say in your own words that you're covering all of this ground and how it is connecting. What that made me wonder is at what point did you know? Um, where to start mm -hmm. because the book kind of begins where we, we learn about Atlantic City and we mm -hmm. learn about your family's relationship with it and your father's relationship with gambling. Um, did you know you were going to start there? When did you like when did the title arrive for you? Yeah, um, it yeah, I feel like I had to go back to the, the place that this book was the most kind of like fraught in that's Atlantic City. Um, I definitely, that was the first kind of piece of nonfiction I wrote was Meet Me Tonight when I said it was a standalone essay at the time and then I kind of expanded it. Um, and, you know, it literally, I think it begins with, with let's begin here, <laughs> uh, which is kind of interesting because it doesn't, Dragon Fruit is before it these days, but, um, and, and actually tries to describe like when the boardwalk came to be, like what, what actually made the boardwalk exist. Um, but then I say like, you know, just to be clear, this is not our story, you know, and thinking about kind of how waves of immigrants came later and like came to the to the boardwalk with different kind of desires and plans. And there's a scene at the end of this kind of uh, little uh, opening where, you know, we're, we're all kind of standing there um, after getting off the Chinese tourist bus where, you know, you, you know, whatever, you take your $10 gambling voucher. Um, and we're just standing there like looking at the crab legs at the Palace Court Buffet and we're just like, oh, this is so fancy, but we never touch it. We never eat it, you know, because it's just like this like marveling. And I wanted to open the book with this kind of like marveling for something you want, but you can't have. I think, uh, again, I feel like the biggest kind of like, I guess, larger theme of the book is like desire and like, you know, what it means to long for what you don't have or to make do with what you have. I think that's ultimately it. Um, and it's a love song for my mom. I mean, she's like the biggest character in the book. And I, I did, I did, I could read a little section from wongmom.com. I also broke a rule of nonfiction. I made up a character, which I don't know. I feel like it's kind of like, you're not really supposed to like make up stuff in memoir, but I'm very clear that she's made up. She's just my mom who lives in the internet. Um, wongmom.com, which is by the way, 
uh, going to be real soon. So my friend is actually making her uh, like in the style of old AOL Instant Messenger GeoCities, and you can actually ask her a question; and she'll answer you. Um, but yeah, I love, I love, I feel like it all comes back to my mom in some way or another. So. I love wongmom.com so much. The way it's threaded throughout the memoir, it's just, it's really incredible. So humorous, but comes in at these moments where, where you need answers. Yeah. 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 I feel like, um, yeah, the first time that she shows up, uh, the, the story goes and it's in the, the memoir, but, um, my, my friend Brandon, um, uh, you know, tells me that he wants this website because my mom said something to him, him on a bus in Seattle many years ago and it changed the entire direction of his life. And this happens often with my mom. She has this kind of like ability to kind of like give advice and it changes someone's life. But I don't know what he like heard because it's for him only that my mom was very clear about that. Um, and she was basically like, I wish there was something called wallmom.com where if you're wondering about something, you could just type it in and she will answer you. Um, and so she becomes, I make her a character in the book because like, I'm so like nervous about writing this memoir. This is not poetry, period. Like I can't hide behind a metaphor. I can't sit in an image, which I love to do, or a, a, a moment of enjambment. I actually have to reflect. It's really uncomfortable. And so I talk to her, I talk to wongmom.com. I type my questions into her, you know, the URL or whatever, the chat box. And she answers in, in many ways. And I think in my mind, I thought it was also, because again, I wanted this, there's a lot of heavy stuff in the book. There's a lot of trauma, but I wanted so much joy in the act of writing it, which is maybe why I made up this character. But like in, in many ways, I kept thinking to myself that like, if I'm really nervous about writing all this kind of like, everyone knows a little too much about me, then at least wongmom.com acts as a kind of like speculative, like ridiculousness. And it's like a little play off the, the I Ching, you know, kind of like a ha ha ha. Oh, you think my mom is like wise? Well, she is. That's a weird thing. But at the same time, it's like a, a kind of like a, a nod to, I think, like the idea of divination and just like, uh, I remember when I was growing up, my, I asked my mom, I was like, well, what's my religion? Which is a weird question to ask your family. My mom's like, you're Chinese. Like, oh. Okay. So I guess that's, yeah. I worship my mom. It's kind of, again, I feel like a creepy groupie now that I think about it, but yeah. It makes sense because she's, she's rendered with so much love throughout the entire book. Yeah. Um, and my, my fiction brain was immediately kind of like, like, that's my favorite character, you know, but you know, but this is, this is your mom and it's really beautiful to, to see. Um, you use in the memoir, the phrase restaurant baby. Yeah. And I was, uh, I think it's really interesting the way that you talk, you're just talking about class and mm -hmm. um, upward mobility. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment in the memoir where you talk about your mother's attitude towards your cooking or your cooking in the re restaurant or your, you know, the work that you were yeah. and were not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about that at all? Like what's your, because then you talk a lot about food afterwards and it's, it's, it's this really interesting meditation. Totally. Um... Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I um, my mom was very adamant about like me not really learning how to cook or like being in the kitchen. I that was I'll be clear. I did all the prep, <laughs> like meaning like I did all the I cleaned the like poop vein. I don't know what to call it out of the shrimp um, over and over and over. I just sat there and cleaned that shrimp. Um, but she didn't want me to learn how to cook or she didn't want to be like, she, I never got to like watch her, like learn her cooking because she was just like, I want you to, to like do something else with your life because the restaurant life is so, so hard. I don't know if any of you are like restaurant, you know, in, in the restaurant industry, but it's long hours. It's just physically hard. Um, and I think that this book is also a lot about labor. Um, and as much as it is about class is that, you know, I think a lot about how, you know, my mom, there's also a chapter in here um, that's about the USPS. My mom is a postal clerk and she's worked a night shift for 26, 27 years. Um, and that does a lot to your body as much as her body has been affected by restaurant labor as well. Um, and I feel like I, I can't, I feel a lot of complicated feelings about like, 
you know, being a professor, even though I think I overwork myself as a result, I'm such the, I'm such my mother's daughter in that way. Um, but I think about like, you know, her kind of shooing me out of the kitchen and then what it means to like finally, um, you know, like learn to cook later. I think it happens in Finding the Bloodline where I actually talk about how sexy it is to actually like cut ginger. I want to read the line. Sorry, I just like, I'm like talking about my book and I'm just like, oh, like I forgot that I wrote it. It's just like, I know. Uh, right. The chopping feels sexy. The scent of ginger and garlic fills the kitchen creamy and winter warm. I wrap myself in it in the sharp lines of a knife. I fight the urge to shove the cloves and slivers into my mouth and eat them raw. The spicy heat radiating, radiating in my entire throat. I don't know if I'm doing it right. I've called my mother at work twice already, but it doesn't matter. I need joke now. My body is wildly out of balance, shocked by anxiety and panic attacks, and I grasp at the one thing my stomach demands. Um, and that's when I, I like basically learned to make joke or like, People call it kanji. I kind of go on this like rant about the word kanji, but um, <laughs> anyway, I can, and oh right, in the book I can't say caring kanji, but um, but it was caring kanji, um, <laughs> which is a white woman who said she basically like discovered kanji and was like calling it the breakfast cure. Um, yeah, um, but all to say like I didn't make this soup. This joke is like chicken noodle soup for Chinese people. <laughs> And I didn't make it until I was like in my late thirties um, during the pandemic. And so it was like, oh, you know, my mom was just like, <laughs> she was like, she, I don't know why she didn't teach this like to me, but I remember I sent her a picture and my brother weirdly had just made joke for the first time in his life ever at the same exact moment. That's what I mean by these weird cosmic connections my family has. And my mom just like hearted it and just said like, I want it, I want to eat it. And so it was very sweet, but it's weird because if I was at home, she would have been, have been like, don't you make it, like, you're failing. So it's kind of complicated because she's just like, that sucks. But also, like, it's great when I don't have to, she doesn't have to eat it. She's, does that make any sense? Like, she's like, good job, but I won't eat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's... <laughs> okay, Des, what, um, you, you told us what the most difficult part of the book may have been um, to, to write was, can you pinpoint something that just kind of flowed that felt... I don't know if easy is the right word, but you know, yeah. flow. <laughs> <laughs> I love that word flow. It's like, what does it mean? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I feel like I took a lot of joy from some uh, chapters in here that felt, I guess maybe that's an attempt at flow is like the joy of writing certain chapters. And there's one chapter in here that I, I have a, it's like my kind of personal favorite. It's my mom's actual personal favorite. Since by the way, um, she, uh, her her written um, and reading English is not as strong. She's incredibly like, you know, she can speak very fluently verbally. But like when the aud I recorded the audio book and she finally read one of my books, which is really exciting because my poetry collections, she carries them to work at night shift and she asks her coworkers to read them out loud to her, which is really sweet. But now she heard the audio book, um, uh, which, which I read, which is kind of really special. But my personal favorite, uh, like another one that has flow to me is like to love a mosquito and it's for my brother and it's the cutest, the most heartbreaking, I guess, chapter in thinking about like siblinghood and I don't know if other people here have like siblings, but that, that kind of relationship is so unique um, and uh, it begins with us kind of just like crushing mosquitoes on the wall. <laughs> and like the smearing of the blood and I say like if it doesn't look like a painting it doesn't count like the blood has to like get all up in there and we count them like scientists we tally them up like and my brother's just screaming suckers suckers and it's just like this sweet moment where we're just like killing these mosquitoes um and then like but I taught him to play this game called mosquito wars and he's the most tender like person I, I know in my entire life and he would never ever touch a a creature and so it's interesting by the end of the essay it's like he would I imagine him actually taking the mosquitoes in a butterfly net and releasing them in a park somewhere like I, I it's like it's a it's a chapter I think that flows for me because it's like really deepening I think this idea of kind of like what it means to be tender but also what it means to be rageful and how that kind of keeps in check um I had a lot of fun writing this particular chapter um and 
there's this one little aunt, like little story that my brother um he he read this he only read this essay i guess when it was like a standalone essay and he actually recorded himself reading um this really hard part of the chapter where my father kind of rejects him when um, he goes over to watch some basketball with him and my dad's like no i don't i don't want to do that right now i'm too busy and my brother decides to read this as a kind of like uh, blog content um for the journal that originally published it and he has his gamer gear on as he's recording this like he's a gamer at the you know the headphones the lit up like um, keyboard he's like let's begin i want to remind you this is my sister's essay not mine and he reads this really <laughs> intense chapter section from the chapter at the end of it he's just like what my sister said was true <laughs> which is cute but he's just like but I read this one because when I'm a dad, I will not do that to my child. And it was so heartbreakingly tender, I couldn't publish it. And he spelled mosquito wrong in the YouTube link. And it was like, oh, Steven, you're such the sweetest kid ever. I don't know. Anyway, so I don't know if that's the answer to Flo, but I guess Flo is like the most like, the one that gets me so, like, I don't know, like all the feelings, I guess, and it flowed really well. I had such a fun time writing it. Um, but yeah, so yeah. I love that. To love a mosquito. It's a cute chapter. You, you write with such love about your, your mother and your brother. Um, and I wonder, just in general, writing about people in your life, but also looking at the, the more diff difficult relationships, um, yeah. these, these exes, oh, the God. relationship with your father. <laughs> yeah. Does because I'm thinking I'm using again like my fiction brain and sometimes when I write about difficult people in my life I'm turning them into characters and sometimes I'm showing them a lot more grace than I can show like the real people who may have caused harm in my life or harm to others um, but I don't know that that's the, the same thing so I'm just curious for you writing through this does that change how you view your relationship with with anyone or even with uh, Atlantic City even if it's away from people. Yeah, I think that, especially writing this book, I think it's changed my relationship with my father a lot, who again is not in my life, but um, uh, I, it might, might be 15, 16 years since I've seen him, and I'm, I'm going to go see him actually uh, when I end the tour, um, and I don't know how that's gonna feel. In fact, when I was writing this chapter, um, Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City, I'll just read the very end of it. I, I don't think I'm spoiling. Can you spoil life? I, I'm sorry. I just like had this moment where I was like, oh, I don't spoil the ending. I was like, that's my life. So can, you can't spoil that, right? But I don't know. Um, but uh, I was working on this chapter. And I'm the type of person who, yeah, puts on my mom's coat and writes a poem. Like, I like to do participatory. I do a lot of, like, performance art and, like, visual art and, you know, stuff like that. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to end this chapter by going to Atlantic City and, like, seeing my father and, like, I will have more to write in this chapter. But I couldn't do it. Like, I, I literally was too emotional and I just couldn't do it. Like, I knew that, like, it would maybe make for a stronger piece in the memoir but i was like oh, i can't do that i'm not ready so it's interesting that i finished this memoir and then i think i'm actually ready you know does that make any sense like i wrote this book and i'm finally ready to see my father and go to atlantic city so it's like ah like so i think i did weirdly process a lot but um yeah i'll just like read the very end of meet me tonight in atlantic city again i can't spoil my life so i hope i hope you're not mad about this um okay it's about the rebel which is a casino that like I don't know if any of you have has anybody spent time in Atlantic City I'm curious I know we're so far away um, <laughs> but I feel like I feel like yeah you, I, yeah <laughs> okay uh, let's not forget this is the story of lost enterprises of boarded up pizza joints lonely stuffed animals sands tipsy game operators echoing parking lots with floating trash and neon lights toppled over like sandcastles a ghost city. In 2012, the Rebel, a $2.4 billion casino, opened 
and the rebel was the most anticipated undertaking in Atlantic City at the time. The entire exterior was built with glass as if it could disappear at night, a casino that disappears into thin air, which it did just two years later. It's fair to say that the rebel did not have luck on its side. During construction, lightning struck a worker's bucket lift and killed him. Three construction executives died in a freak plane crash. This was another world my father could have dreamt in, abandoned and rotting, unlucky luxury. Hotel rooms with punched out windows, echoing concert halls with families of soprano rats, seagulls building velvet nests, declaring their own American dream in feathery squawking bird shit glory. Jim Whelan, the former mayor of Atlantic City said, Atlantic City is like Dracula. We can't kill it, no matter how hard we try. <laughs> Yeah, direct quote. <laughs> These days, if I close my eyes, I can hear Bruce Springsteen's Atlantic City playing in Tony's Baltimore Grill, a surviving Atlantic City pizzeria, or maybe our old Chinese-American takeout amid the hiss of the wok firing. Sometimes I imagine my father in the future, in his late 90s, strolling along an empty boardwalk with me. He walks with his arms cradled behind his back as elderly Chinese folks often do. And we walk, and he points out how the howling waves sound just like they do in the South China Sea. What kind of luck do I need for this to come true? Um, so yeah, it's kind of the answer to your question. is like, I still, have, I still have hope for him. I still hope I can see him when he's 90, in his 90s. Um, so, and I, I won't be able to stroll the boardwalk with him when I, come home, but I will see him. And I don't know how I'm going to feel about that, but writing this book actually made me able to do it. So, yeah. yeah. That was really beautiful. Um, I'm going to, I have just a couple more questions and then we're, we're going to take some uh, questions from you all. So, uh, <laughs> um, well, I'm curious about, first of all, I'm, I'm in awe of people who write across genres in general. But you said you were working on both of both um, yeah. your memoir and your last uh, your your last poetry collection, <laughs> um, kind of at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though you get more vulnerable when you're writing uh, prose. What I mean, what is that? What is that like bouncing back and forth between them? What is what is poetry giving you? Um, if, if memoir is forcing that vulnerability onto the page, what is poetry then? Are you going back to poetry? Always, <laughs> always. I, I will always be writing poems no matter what, even if I don't write them down. Um, it's really interesting. I just, uh, it's a great question because like uh, my editor who's fantastic uh, at Tin House, Elizabeth DeNeo, she actually tasked me to write the last chapter about writing, kind of very meta. And it's funny because I asked all my poets to write a poetics, you know, at the end of the quarter. And I never really wrote one for myself. Like I never wrote about my journey is in terms of becoming a poet. And I think that I write my best poems in the bathtub. I just sit there really hot. And then like, I don't write anything down. And then they disappear. Sometimes it will come back to me. But I, I think that poetry for me is like a dreamy space of like intensity. Like it is it is baby Jane opening her eyes, like staring at like well, the world for the first time. Like I feel like my poet self is incredibly powerful. It's almost like, uh, like it's my most confident Jane. Like I, I feel really strong as a like when I put on my like poetry like, um, like outfit. But when I write memoir, it's like it's like my goofball, so my awkward self comes out. Like I'm. Just, you know, I'm just spilling things and I'm just like, ah, oh, like, I'm just like, uh, like, I'm just like poop, like, you know, I'm just like telling bad jokes, like I'm so goofy and it's all those other parts of myself. And I am grateful for that. I wasn't able to really do, I can't make terrible jokes. I, I had never wrote, well, maybe once I did, I wrote lol in a poem once, but like, I feel like I was finally able, I think in memoir to be all these different parts of myself, like the heart, like, I, and to, to reflect and to actually like stay in the moment and not actually run away 
<laughs> I feel I, uh, in a poem, my favorite thing, I have a lot of favorite things in poetry, but I love the volta. It's a turn in the poem. It's a moment where you're writing this poem and then a volta happens. You go somewhere you completely didn't expect you were going, where you're going to go. And you can't plan for a volta. And I love voltas because of that bewilderment. I think in nonfiction, there was a surprising different type of volta for me um, because it was like not a volta in terms of like something that was like based in language or lyricism or even like a formal volta via the space of the page, but it was like an emotional, like it was like, like, uh, like another layer of like my reflecting on my relationships and my life had opened up like this huge cavern. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is intense. Um, but I also really loved it. I'm so grateful for returning to prose. The one thing I will say too, is like, I actually began as a fiction writer way, 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 way back then, like, back then Matt Johnson who I know you know was my uh you know mentor I just read with him at Powell's that was such an amazing kind of like uh full circle I think to the person who really inspired me to start writing um and uh to write in scene was so nice like I had forgotten actually you know to write diet I was like oh it's so nice to write dialogue and to be in scene and I really enjoyed that but I've always been the type of person that does like a lot of like intermingling of genres and I do a lot of like a performance art like I've eaten my palms before and um uh -huh. I yeah I know it's I just like <laughs> yeah it's so strange and just like I um I just am always the type of person who's like very very curious and like always wanting to kind of try something uh, new out and so I don't really know sometimes I don't know what's next but I will say I'm very very enamored right now by like hand making paper and pulping paper and I've been doing this with my students who will write poems and we'll just throw it into a blender and like yeah! you know just like <laughs> and we scream together and it's very intense and then we make this beautiful paper that we write new poems on and then we like blend it again and it's just like I don't know and maybe I'm just I don't know I that's a, not a clear answer between poetry and prose but I think like I think I just like blending i guess of, of genre and i hope that you know more people do that because it's so fun i think we i'm always trying to get back to my 10 year old self i think as a writer i know there are many many writers here and i i think about the wonder we had and the playfulness we had when we were that age and like the risks that we took because um, we just didn't maybe care as much in terms of what people thought and i want to get back to that jane so badly so yeah and here's my quick fire question. Are you, oh, are you coming, whoa, top chef. Are you coming back to fiction? You got a novel? Wow. <laughs> ever, ever. I, I was so excited when Matt Johnson came, like appeared in the memoir. Um, and also hearing that, you know, the fiction you were writing before Iowa. And, yep. um, the answer, I have an idea. <laughs> but let me tell you, it's going to be a thriller. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I literally, if I, my dream of a novel is going to be like, there will be murder. <laughs> and it will be like, you know, like something ridiculous, okay. high drama, um, and tomatoes. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> I just, I mean, anyway. <laughs> so we, we want to make sure we, we have uh, some time for questions from from our audience here. Um, don't be shy. I hear there are oh my God, rewards for your... You can light things on fire. It's not the quality of your question here. necessarily, <laughs> but there are matchbooks. Yes, we have a question here. Okay. Uh, it's not a very uh, original question, but uh, which writers um, have you loved, you love, and influence you in any Asian or Asian American writers that oh. you love? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a beautiful question about kind of like who are your kind of uh, literary lineage, I think, and especially thinking about Asian American writers. Um, I kind of uh, blocked out the fact that I did a PhD. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and it was critical. Uh, so uh, I, I studied Asian American literature. So I also teach Asian American studies. Um, and so I teach an Asian American lit class. And it's like, oh my gosh, like, I remember when I taught my very first Asian American lit class, I never took one as an undergrad or even a graduate student. And the first time I was teaching a class, an Asian American literature class, I was taking my own class. I was 
it, I was crying over the copying machine. I was like, I'm taking the, the class that I wanted to take, but I'm teaching it. It's so confusing. Um, but uh, I mean, of course, there's so many I can't even start to, to name, but I think that uh, a writer that really has influenced me, I think like going back to Jonathan's question about like moving across genres and spaces is definitely Teresa Hakyam Cha. Um, because like her work, I think as a visual artist, performance artist, but all, like what is dictate like her book? Like I don't, we can't define it. And I think that she gave me a lot of freedom, I think, to kind of like try out all these different types of things, like to, to try to, um, I think like unpeel some of these layers in ways that weren't direct, um, I suppose. So she definitely influenced me a lot. Um, and I will just like, I don't know if it's not naming a particular person, but a shout out to, to Kunima. I know we have a lot of Kunima fellows in the audience, but like finding like an Asian American organization, like you can feel so isolated, I think, um, in many ways. And, you know, there's a lot of internalized racism as I was growing up, but I also kind of like unpack a bit in the memoir. Um, but it felt so special to me to connect with community. Um, so shout out to to all the fellows in Kunimon. They're definitely everyone I teach, you know, uh, too. Um, but that's a beautiful question because um, I, you know, my students, I, I teach this uh, class, the Asian American literature class, um, and it's 70, it's a 70 uh, student lecture, um, and it's a 200 level. And at the end of it, my students are like, what, what's the next level? What, what's the next class? I'm like, we don't have it in the curriculum. And it breaks my heart a little bit because I'm just like, they want more, you know? We went to go see everything everywhere all at once together. You know, optional field trip. I spent time out of my, like, you know, classroom. I mean, I went with, like, I shouldn't say kids, but like, you know what I mean? Like, I, you know, but they all show up. Can you believe that? It was so special. Um, and we watched the movie together and there were students who were not my students. Uh, they brought their roommates and they're like, oh, we wish we should have taken your class. I was like, you can come. But anyway, it's really, yeah, so. I think there's been a big uh, evolution of um, Asian American writing. Mm -hmm. So when I was in college, I read uh, Maxine Hong Kingston. Oh, of course, Maxine Hong Kingston, yes. Away because there was nothing authentic before Yes, her. Woman Warrior, absolutely. And I, when I met, so I met, there's actually a scene where I meet Maxine Hong Kingston in the book, and uh, she has this wonderful uh, long white hair, and her hair starts to intermingle. And I was like, my dreams are coming true. <laughs> And she says to me and a friend Sally and Mao, like, you know, I you know, I write, you know, for you all. And so it's kind of like the passing of the, the next generation, the next generation. And so um I do explore, I think like like I said, like this book is I don't know if I'll ever write a memoir again. This was really hard. <laughs> um and so as a result of like uh kind of the vulnerability of this book, I was like, I'm gonna put it all in. So yes, it goes down my uh, Asian American literary lineage in here too as much as it does with, you know, they gave up my, my family and my father and my mother um, and my shitty ex-boyfriends. But, um, but yeah, that's a beautiful question. Yeah. So hand in the back. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to the relationship between food and literature and if you would consider the memoir food writing. Ooh, great question about like food writing um, and memoir. Uh, yeah, I love to eat. Uh, I just had like the most delightful bento box trip before I got here, um, which I really appreciate because like it's, I like little tastes of everything. Like everything has to, you know, like anyway. Um, but I, I do think that this book is so deeply tied to kind of like food writing. In many ways, I, I, if I kind of joke around this, like if I'm not, a, if I wasn't a professor, my literal dream would be to be a food writer and like get free food. Like all I want, all I want, universe, listen to me. I just want free food. Like I just want free food, free food. I'm just gonna say it one more time. Like, uh, and you know, love to write about it, but like, you know, like I just always love free food. And so I think that there is something about like, in this memoir and all of actually how to not be afraid of everything has a lot of food uh, writing in it too since i teach food writing as well um i think that food unlocks a lot of stories right and thinking about um you know food justice and our like familial memories like everything is so sensory and sensual and like complicated when we think about our like 
food histories and our food ways. Um, and I think the big thing for me, you know, which I definitely talk about, because I was, again, writing these two books at the same exact time, is uh, about my, my family's, you know, history and, you know, my family's, you know, relationship to the Great Leap Forward, also named, known as the Great Famine, where, you know, uh, my ancestors, my grandfather's family all perish. They, they starve to death, even though my family would never use that term. Um, and what it means to kind of, my mom grew up, she made this joke when I dated a vegetarian. Um, he actually wasn't a, a bad ex-boyfriend, actually. He was one of the very few. It was fine. Um, but like he, <laughs> no, it's terrible. Um, but he, he's, he was a vegetarian and my mom was like, oh, I was vegetarian too. And I was like, no, it's just you didn't have, you didn't afford meat or, you know, so it's like, it's really interesting hearing these stories. And I grew up in gluttony. I grew up surrounded by food. And I swear, I do think, and I talk about this in the memoir, that I think I'm eating on behalf of the, my ghosts and that I, I, I eat. I, I just can't, I talk about how like, I can't, I still struggle with food waste and I, I have, I will just eat rotting food. I will just like, I'm just like a, like a garbage can of sorts where I just, it's kind of, kind of sickly where I'll eat food that's gone way too bad because I feel so much shame in wasting it. Um, you know, and I, I, I remember when I first saw a compost bin, um, I wanted to eat it. Like it was such a weird desire. I was looking at this compost bin. I, it, it was at college. Like I'd never seen like a compost bin out specifically. Like you just said compost bin and I opened it. I was like, whoa, like, it was like moldy and like beautiful with like jewels. And I just wanted so badly to like, just like suck on the pistachio shells. I know this is a weird answer to your question, but I, <laughs> this is why I'm a poet, but like I, I was, I was obsessed, you know? And so I'm, the book unravels a little bit about that, kind of like, what does it mean to come from a history of hunger and grow up in a space of gluttony? Um, but also like, what does it mean, I think, to finally, because it's, it's related to upward mobility, finally kind of let go of some of those greens I can't eat. Like, I'm, I'm working through it. Um, but uh, just just if you see me out there, just be like, Jane, don't, don't eat that. <laughs> you know, it's expired. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm sure there are. Yes, uh, Christelle. So um, you spoke about um, the photograph of his father and how he wasn't able to be in the photograph. You mentioned what the ghost ghost has had. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting that you wrote the poetry collection and the mark like around the same time, and how also in the poetry collection there are blanks and there's dashes, there's mm -hmm. like silences and spaces that I noticed like resisting the urge to fill in the blank. And I wonder how do you like how do you straddle that especially with poetry and memoir i feel like um sometimes we have like the poetic license of mom.com um but then also like how do you let that like be there without wanting to fill it wow that was so utterly like brilliant i don't even know how to reword that um thank you for don't look at me <laughs> I was, uh thank you that's so so generous um yeah, thinking about kind of silences and um, how in the poetry there are these blanks. Thank you so much for uh, that generous close reading um, in the, the form of the poems too, and the, what it means to physically create a ghost archive through spaces and um, breaths, honestly, too. Um, you know, and I think that that's why I love poetry. I think that's because I could physically do it like on the page. Whereas I think that, you know, in the memoir, I had to find another way to kind of engage those those silences. Um, and I think that in many ways, like wongwong.com does play a little bit with that too. Um, but I think that for me, and at least in writing the memoir, it was actually trying to, it's very meta, but I was trying to actually talk about kind of like what that silence meant for me. So I think there is like a little short kind of chapter in here called Ghost Archive. Um, and a kind of like, as I was writing the book of poetry, it's like reflecting on writing that book where I remember a, a few friends of mine who were kind of doing a lot of archival research for their books. Um, were going to like, like his, you know, like historical archives and going to like museums. And, and I was like, oh, my family is 
like dirt poor. There are like no records of them. In fact, it's dangerous to have records, you know, and thinking about communist China. It's like, and so it was like really interesting where I was just kind of like, I don't have an arc, like what is my archive? Like what could I, what could I have, especially thinking about all the censorship, right, that was happening uh, at that time and the propaganda um, during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And so there's like no, I, I couldn't hold on to anything. In fact, my family's very, very like, we don't talk about anything. Like it's like the, the less you say, the better. The less you say, you survive. Um, and so I couldn't, I never did any research when I say that in terms of interviews with my grandparents. I could never hurt them that way. I could never ask them directly about the Great Leap Forward. Uh, what I did was a lot of like deep listening, like the stories of like, oh yeah, you know, my mother would say on her birthday, she'd get an egg. You know, what does that say, right? What's the blank in that? And so I think when I was writing the, the little mini chapter, Ghost Archive, I was thinking a lot about like, what does it mean to like come from a background where you can't find what you want to find? And like, what do you do with that? It was so frustrating, right? Because you so badly want to know, but you also have to remember that your family worked so hard for you not to know, even when we're just protecting you. And so I, I kind of actually started to reflect on that. What does it mean that they were trying to protect me? I remember when I got a, a Fulbright fellowship, uh, supposedly, I'm um, honorable thing, I suppose, like, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, that's pretty kind of a exciting news. And I told my family, and they're like, don't do it, don't do it. Why would you go to China? No, no, no. And I was like, huh? And it was like, it was supposed to be a proud moment. And they're like, don't go, don't go. And so it was really interesting because they're, they're, that protection is so key. Um, and so I think that's how kind of how I wrestled with it in the memoir and to really kind of like undo those layers, um, too. But I also am starting to think, what if I don't have that kind of archive, we have to redefine what an archive is. I didn't, I don't have any photos of me as a baby, period. We were, we didn't have enough money for a camera. I start to exist in photographs at two years old. I will never know what I look like as a baby, baby, baby. Um, only my mom's stories. So there's no archive, there's no physical archive, like, right, that I can touch. But the archive is in storytelling. It is oral, these oral traditions. Um, that's all I can have, right, at these kind of like moments. But um, one project that I'm kind of playing around with, and I feel like I showed people at Randolph, um, was uh, I've been thinking about other types of archives. And I went home and I've just been like gathering my mom's stuff, like random stuff, her outfits. That's an archive. Her amazing outfits from the 80s, 90s, which I totally wear now. It's like, that's an archive. What is it telling me about her at that point, you know, in her life historically? Um, and then I got her English to, uh, her Chinese to English dictionary. And that's an archive, like the little notes she made uh, when she was learning the language here. So I, we, I think we really have to rethink, you know, what the archive is, but, and like put our ear to those like blank spaces or those silences so you can hear a, a different kind of like humming underneath that's not going to be quite clear but it's so sonically there so thank you that's such a uh that made me actually yeah i'm still i'm still i'm gonna still think about that thank you we have uh time for one more question Lily. first of all i want to say that i'm sure that i'm speaking for many of us that we want to read that thriller novel <laughs> <laughs> I really like what you were saying about sook and yeah. kanji, mm -hmm. that you want to use the word sook. Mm -hmm. And I think my question is, what is the process that you go through about how you decide how much to explain? That there, there is your, what you know and what you've experienced, and then you're writing for the reader. Mm -hmm. And what is the process in which you decide how much you're going to explain about why it's took mm -hmm. and not kanji? Mm -hmm. And when do you decide, no, it's just going to speak for itself and, and mm -hmm. the reader's just going to have to, to know this is my own personal experience? Yeah, that's a great question about like thinking about using terms like joke, joke and uh, like uh like thinking about audience i guess and kind of the pressures of trying to or like people wanting to you have to have 
people explain things, right? And this was something that like Hans, anyone in the publishing industry is going to like come up against. Like, I remember uh, I said like Toy Sunnies, and it said like I had, before I had like the copy editor wrote like a dialect off Cantonese. I was like, well, this really it could just be Toy Sunnies. Like it doesn't have to like have that. And I'll be honest, I don't. It was such a blur. I don't even know what made. I like I remember like. I should really read my book, actually. I was like, I had a moment where I was just like, huh. Really I'm pretty good. sure we took it out. I'm pretty sure we took it out. But I remember the copy editor giving me that comment and being like, eh. or like, um, there are a lot of like moments of like, oh, explain this or tell me about this. I was like, well, no, uh, I don't want to. And I mean, I think that the book is kind of rageful. Um, it has a, there's a lot of anger in it. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of tenderness as much as there is in, in that too. And I think that uh, and I also admit to, I mean, this is everything I think is very kind of raw and true to my own experience in the sense of like, you know, my Toy Sunnies is, is, is terrible. <laughs> and like there is Toy Sunnies uh, in, in Cantonese in like threaded in the book. And I remember when I was recording the audio book, I was like, oh, crap, I don't know how to say this right. And so I was always calling my mom, I was telling the producer, I was just like, I'm sorry, I have to call my mom, I forgot my Chinese name again. Like, you know, my mom's like saying it over the phone. And like, might as well just write about that, I guess. So it was like double, it was like two things. It was just kind of like the pressure, I think, from like, uh, uh, I guess like co copy editing process, et cetera, of like trying to like, oh, make this a little more clear, but also like my own kind of failure of like, oh, damn it, I don't even know if I'm like, trans like translating this right in terms of what this possibly, this word means even. I remember someone actually uh, asked me, it was like, what does cheesing mean? And I'm just like, I don't even know how to describe it, but I think if anyone knows what that has heard that, you get it. And so it's like, I didn't, but I didn't translate it at all, you know? And so I feel like that's, I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but that's just what I'm trying to say. It's like, you have to be authentic in your like messiness. Um, but yeah, I know I did some major pushback. I think the biggest thing was like, I think that uh, when I was recording the audiobook, or rather before, um, they asked uh, for a professional uh, to read it. Um, but the audition tapes that I heard, um, they were Mandarin speaking, um, and we're not from Jersey. And I, and I was like, okay, um, kind of important to have even a hot mess Toy Sunny speaker, even a, a failure of a Toy Sunny speaker is is okay. Like that's me in the book. And if you're not gonna say certain words in a Jersey way, uh, you know what I mean? What if someone said water? What if someone said water? It would disturb me deeply. Uh, so I, I bet I was like, wait, let me record the book. It was last minute. I think I, I, I think it was like within a few days where I was just like, they finally said yes, okay, and I like, was in the studio and I did it. Um, but thank you for that question. And all to say, like, I didn't want to. Uh, I hope I, I tried my best to push back. I think. Uh, against these moments of like explanation, um, though I don't know if I wanted to fight on all of them. I'll be honest, there was like thousands of comments, and I, it, it's all a blur. In poetry, no, there are no comments. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, wow, weird, great. <laughs> so that's why I don't know if I, I and I, I mean, thank you to the Tin House team, and they were really, really, they were on it. We went through a lot of copy edits double fact checking they really wanted this to be the best book it possibly could and I'm so grateful for that because like I think coming from a poetry background I didn't even think about any of these things you know and so I'm really grateful for that kind of like deep deep close like Hawkeye to the book because I think it be ended up being the best book I think I could make you know like even the work cited like I'm like ah huh? I was supposed to have a work cited they're like yes and I was like what because I just think coming from a, from a poet's background I was just like I didn't even think about it. I don't know why. I should have kept sources the whole time. But, you know, things also disappear from the internet. Um, we ought to be okay with that, too. So thank you for that question. Um, joke forever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I do believe that's our, our time with Jane Wong. Yay. But she will be signing books for people getting the book, right? So, um... And by Jonathan's book, it's so good, it's too! Right. You should, you're gonna <laughs> sign! <laughs> and let's... Thank you! Uh, thank you, thank you. Thanks to
both so much for your time and talent, and I appreciate you. Uh, and I appreciate all of you for joining us this evening. I'm just here to let you know that, uh, like I said, we have copies of both Jane and Jonathan's books at the front near where you came in, and uh, you can bring them back here to the back desk, that back desk next to the refreshment table. That's where I'm going to have Jane signing uh, copies. Uh, feel free to make yourselves comfortable. Keep in mind we close at 9 p.m. But uh, other than that, thank you so kindly, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.